Hello and welcome to ACP's webinar on the topic of the Skilled Nursing Facility Final Rule for Fiscal Year 2018. This is a big topic to cover in an hour, so we're going to dive right in. We are very pleased to welcome Ellen Strunk as our featured speaker for today's session. Many of you are probably familiar with Ellen. She is a well-known and well-respected physical therapist who has worked in a variety of settings as a clinician, a manager director, and as a consultant over the course of her career. Presently, Ellen is the owner of Rehab Resources and Consulting, a company specializing in helping customers understand the CMS prospective payment systems in skilled nursing facilities and home health settings, with a particular focus on how to deliver medically necessary therapy services in those settings. Her experience includes utilizing medical record reviews and data systems to help both inpatient and outpatient therapy providers meet regulatory guidelines. She lectures nationally on the topics of pharmacology for rehabilitation professionals, exercise and wellness for older adults, and billing, coding, and documentation for therapy. Ellen will be covering the first three items on today's content outline. Updates to the payment rates used in skilled nursing facility prospective payment system, revisions to the SNF quality reporting program, and finalized policies for the SNF value-based purchasing program. I will then speak briefly about how to prepare for success with these items and how ACP can be an ally to you on that front. Finally, we will conclude with a Q&A session if time allows. Ellen, let's turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Amy, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, to get us started, I want to remind everyone that this rule becomes effective on October 1, 2017. That's because the fiscal year for skilled nursing facilities begins on October 1 and ends on September 30th. The rule applies to freestanding skilled nursing facilities as well as any skilled nursing facilities that are located in a hospital setting. It also applies to swing bed hospitals in rural facilities. It does not apply to any swing beds that are located inside a critical access hospital. Now, how do you know if you're a critical access hospital? If you're unsure of your classification, the best way to find out is to talk to your administrator or billing office and they can tell you. I've also listed the reference here of this rule and you can find it by going to www.cms.gov and uh, typing this in the search button. Now this slide shows the uh, major areas that the final rule addressing addresses. However, in the interest of time and the fact that this audience may not be interested in all of these topics, we won't be covering all of them today. I have included on this slide just some abbreviations that are referenced throughout this presentation. So um, I just wanted to provide a quick reference if you do need to go back and check those. So let's dive in. The first area that we are going to cover is usually the one that most people are looking for right away, which is how much are the payment rates going to be updated. The Social Security Act requires that the skilled nursing facility prospective payment system rates be updated annually. The federal per diem rate is applied to any days of covered SNF services furnished during that fiscal year. And as I mentioned earlier, the fiscal year for the skilled nursing facility runs from October 1 through September 30th of the next calendar year. So this rule applies to all services provided on or after October 1st, 2017 through and including September 30th, 2018. Keep in mind that for each rate that we see in the final rule, there is a case mix classification system applied to these services in addition to any wage adjustments for every locality in the nation. Now, for this fiscal year 2018, Medicare undertook a rebasing of the SNF market basket, which essentially means they decided to use a different year to look at base costs. So for fiscal year 2018, they are going to be using the base year of 2014 to compare costs to rather than fiscal year 2010. So for fiscal year 2018, that would have been an estimated 2.6% increase in payments to skilled nursing facilities. However, because of a requirement that was included back in 2015 in the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, also known as MACRA, skilled nursing facilities won't see a 2% increase. Why? 
because the MACLA law signed in 2015 stated that no setting will receive an update of more than 1% in fiscal year 2018. They plan to use that extra money to pay off any other deficits in the Medicare system. So, instead of the estimated 2% market basket increase that skilled nursing facilities would have received, SNFs will only receive a 1% increase on all payments between October 1, 2017 through September 30, 2018. However, there is also the requirement that all skilled nursing facilities submit their quality data through the MDS. And if they fail to submit the minimum amount of data, they will receive a two percentage point reduction to their update. Now, most skilled nursing facilities don't have a problem meeting this since all the data is submitted through the MDS. And before billing a rug rate, the MDS must be transmitted. But it is possible for some skilled nursing facilities to get behind on completing all their discharge assessments. So that's why it's important to make sure that all MDSs are submitted timely. In the final rule, you can look for tables two and three, and these tables reflect the updated components of the unadjusted federal rates for fiscal year 2018 prior to adjustment for case mix. And I've included them on this slide. Currently, skilled nursing facility rates are divided into four categories, nursing case mix, therapy case mix, therapy non-case mix, which is an amount added to all rug rates that are not therapy, and a non-case mix amount, which is added to all rug rates for things like capital expenses. The next major component of the final rule is the Skilled Nursing Facility Quality Reporting Program. The SNF Quality Reporting Program has been years in the making. The Affordable Care Act required that Medicare find a way to begin paying providers not on intensity of services and volume, but on quality of care. The Protecting Access to Medicare Act, or PAMA, established that skilled nursing facilities would have a value-based payment program as well, and that should be established by fiscal year 2019. And then we have the IMPACT Act, or Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act of 2014, which mandated that Medicare develop a quality reporting program for not just skilled nursing facilities, but also long-term care hospitals, inpatient rehab facilities, and home health agencies. This amendment to the, Security, to the Social Security Act was probably the biggest change in the post-acute care world since the Balanced Budget Act. Now, the Skilled Nursing Facility Quality Reporting Program requirement applies to freestanding SNFs, SNFs affiliated with acute care facilities, and all non-critical access hospital swing bed rural hospitals. The goal is to allow for the exchange of information among these PAC providers and other providers and to use the data to enable access to longitudinal information and to facilitate coordinated care. Here we see the current quality measures for the skilled nursing facility. Those in blue are the uh, measures where the data comes from the MDS. Those in red represent those where the data comes from claims. There are no HMO patients whose data is counted into these measures. These measures only apply to Medicare Part A fee-for-service. And Medicare has set an 80% minimal completion standard for those collected on the MDS, and achieving this mark will prevent the skilled nursing facility from receiving any reductions in payment. Medicare believed that 80% was a fair criteria, and it is consistent with the other post-acute care programs as well. This slide shows those measures that were finalized in this year's rule for the quality reporting program. They will become effective in fiscal year 2020 for payment, which means that the data will begin to be collected on October 1, 2018. CMS is giving us this year to prepare our systems, our staff, and our care processes. They will then collect the data for a year before they apply it to the payment. 
Now note, I put all of these in blue, which means they come from the MDS as well and also have an 80% requirement for completion. So let's look at each of these a little bit more closely. What they, have, what they finalized to do for the pressure ulcer measure was to remove the current pressure ulcer, ulcer measure entitled percent of residents or patients with pressure ulcers that are new or worsened and to replace it with a modified version of the new measure entitled changes in skin integrity and across post-acute care. The change in this measure name is to reduce confusion about the new measure. This modified version differs from the current one because it includes new or worsened unstageable pressure ulcers that include deep tissue injuries. The modified version of the measure will satisfy the Impact Act domain of skin integrity and changes in skin integrity. The technical specifications for this pressure ulcer measure were updated to ensure that all of the other post-acute care settings are also aligned with this measure. They need to ensure clarity and how the measure is calculated, and they want to avoid possible overcounting of ulcers in the numerator. So they've corrected the specifications to ensure that healed wounds were not incorrectly captured. And they have also corrected the specifications to ensure that residents who expire during their skilled nursing facility stay are excluded from this final measure. So once again, the collection of this new measure begins next October 1, 2018. The reason that Medicare decided to modify this measure was because unstageable pressure ulcers, including DTIs, are similar to stage 2, 3, and 4 ulcers in that they represent poor outcomes, they are a serious medical condition that can result in death and debility, and they're very painful. They're often an avoidable outcome of medical care. Studies show that most pressure ulcers can be avoided and can also be healed in acute, post-acute, and long-term care settings with appropriate medical care. Furthermore, some studies indicate that DTIs if managed using appropriate care, can be resolved without deteriorating into a worsened pressure ulcer. The inclusion of unstageable pressure ulcers, including DTIs in the numerator, is expected to increase measure scores and variability in measure scores. So therefore, Medicare is hoping to improve the ability that they can distinguish between high-performing skilled nursing facilities and low-performing skilled nursing facilities. Keep in mind that there will be risk adjusters for things like functional mobility admission, performance, um, bowel continence, diabetes, uh, peripheral vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, and low body mass index. And Medicare has said that they're going to continue to analyze this measure and they will continue to refine it to ensure that the appropriate risk adjusters are included. The skilled nursing facilities are already required to complete unstageable pressure ulcer data elements on the MDS. While the inclusion of unstageable wounds in the proposed measure results in a measure calculation methodology that is different than the current one, the data elements needed to calculate the measure are already included in the MDS. So this finalized measure will further standardize the data elements used and also it will eliminate duplicative data elements, so hopefully result in an overall reduced reporting burden for skilled nursing facilities. Now, as of this time this deck was put together, uh, we don't have the MDS 3.0 version for next year, but based on information Medicare has shared, they've indicated that these would be the changes they plan to make to Section M to incorporate the new uh, National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel language for deep tissue injuries. Now we're going to take a look at the other four new measures, which are all related to function. They have finalized four new outcome measures related to function. And these four measures are currently being collected and measured in the earth setting. And so that's why they are called an application of earth functional outcome measure. So you can see here, they're going to be looking at change in self-care and change in mobility. 
Discharge Self-Care Score, and Discharge Mobility Score. Now, Medicare recognizes that residents receiving care in skilled nursing facilities include those whose illness, injury, or condition has resulted in a loss of function and for whom rehabilitation is expected to help regain that function. We know that treatment goals in skilled nursing facilities may include fostering their ability to manage their daily activities so they can complete self-care and mobility as independently as possible and hopefully return to a safe, active, and productive life in a community-based setting. Given that the primary goal of many skilled nursing facility residents is an improvement in function, then this measure will assess and document the resident's functional status at admission and at discharge to evaluate the effectiveness of the care provided, as well as the skilled nursing facility's effectiveness. Now, Medicare acknowledged that when they looked at the SNF data, it does show that our treatment practices um, directly influence resident outcomes. So therapy services provided to SNF residents have been found to be correlated with functional outcome improvement. However, what they also found was the amount of treatment that these patients receive varies widely. For example, the amount of therapy treatment provided diff diff differs between a for-profit entity and a not-for-profit entity. It differs on whether a facility is urban or rural. And unfortunately, the variation is not associated with resident characteristics. So because of that variation, Medicare feels the need to monitor functional outcomes relative to the amount of therapy delivered. So the change in function and discharge score measures are intended to capture improvement in those patients for whose increased function is expected. Therefore, they won't be measuring this in patients for whom no change is expected, such as patients who might be comatose or in a vegetative state, or a patient who is completely independent when they are admitted. Now, the change in self-care and change in mobility score uh, measures are both separate measures, but I'm talking about them together because the definitions and the risk adjustment is very similar. Um, I just do want you to realize that um, they are two separate measures, but most everything else is the same. Each of these is going to estimate the mean risk-adjusted improvement in self-care and the mean risk-adjusted improvement in mobility score between admission and discharge. The measure will require the collection of admission and discharge data by trained clinicians using standardized patient data elements. And Medicare feels like these functional activities that clinicians will be assessing are those that we typically assess at the time of admission or discharge. The standardized data elements are coded using a six-level rating scale that indicates the resident's level of independence with the activity. A higher total score indicates more independence. The outcome quality measure also requires the collection of risk factor data, such as prior level of functioning, bladder continence, communication ability, cognitive function, and other things. Now, you may recall from previous webinars that the data elements included in this quality measure were originally developed and tested as part of the post-acute care payment reform demonstration, and it used the Continuity Assessment Record and Evaluation, or CARE item set. The development of the, of the uh, set is described in the report online, but I just wanted to reiterate that reliability and validity testing were conducted and the conclusions were that the functional status items have acceptable reliability and validity. So let's take a look at what the, how the measure is calculated. It takes the total risk-adjusted change in score for each of the um, self-care areas and divides it by the number of Med-A Part-A patients um, admitted except for those who have been excluded and then it takes the risk-adjusted change in score in mobility between admit and DC and divides it by the total number of Med-A patients admitted. The second measure related to function looks at the percentage of patients at your skilled nursing facility 
who met or exceeded an expected discharge score. So think of it this way. If Medicare decides at your skilled nursing facility that your patients would expect to have a discharge score of 60 out of 84 points in mobility, then this measure would tell the public how often did you achieve that score. Did you achieve that score 50% of the time or 75% of the time? That's how this measure will be framed for both self-care and mobility. Now you may be asking, well, how is Medicare going to determine what the discharge score of my patients would be? Well, that's where their algorithms and regression analysis comes in, and you would need a statistician to explain to you the, the, the massive formula. But essentially they take the patient population that you have in your skilled nursing facility, the location that you are, the history of the patient, and predict what that discharge score would be. Now, one differentiation from this measure is that it would only include those residents who are discharged from the SNF, not those who stay as long-term care residents. So the measure is those residents who have a higher or equal to what the predicted discharge score was divided by the total number of Med-A covered resident stays. Now, these four functional measures are going to require some changes to the MDS. This slide probably looks familiar because all of this data um, is, um, shows what we currently collect on our MDS in Section GG, and it is submitted through the CMS ASAP system. Now, Medicare won't be collecting and calculating this measure until October 1, 18, and it won't affect our payment until October 1 of 20. But the MDS must be modified. So, um, keep this that in mind, that beginning October 1 of 18, these um, four new measures in self-care will be added for the skilled nursing facility. And for mobility, this slide shows what the skilled nursing facility currently collects. And beginning October 1 of 18, those checked in blue will be added. So, they, so we will be collecting essentially the same items that the inpatient rehab facility is currently collecting. Now, one more thing is that this question, does the patient walk, will go away. So we will have to answer the walking questions, 10, 50, and 150 feet, on all patients. Even if it's not applicable, we would just code it that way. This is the rating scale that I think that everybody is familiar with. And then we also have some scores for um, areas that we cannot assess. Now, beginning October 1 of 18, we will have one other reason that thing that we that an area was not assessed added, but we won't see that one until next year. Some other areas that were added to the MDS for next year will include a prior level of functioning. So currently we don't have that in our GG, but we will next year. We'll also um, have some risk adjusters because all of these measures will be risk adjusted. Um, one of those is if a patient has an incomplete stay. An incomplete stay is defined as leaving against medical um, advice or uh, length of stay less than three days or someone who dies in the skilled nursing facility. This slide shows some of the risk adjusters that will be applied. Now, there's going to be special risk adjusters applied to um, self-care and a couple of different ones for mobility. So, for instance, for mobility, we'll have um, a risk adjuster of falls. How many recent falls have they had? And for, uh, for, OT, for self-care, we'll have um, a risk adjuster of the use of orthotics and prosthetics. So, some slight differences there. Now, all providers on the webinar today already collect G scores. These items are very similar to what will be in our, our current GG. Now, I just want to um, point out to everybody that it's going to be very important to understand how Section GG is used versus Section G. Um, GG, and therefore those outcome measures that I just talked about, are intended to reflect the skilled nursing facilities' interdisciplinary effectiveness at changing outcome scores. 
it is not intended to be just a therapy measure. So that's, that makes it important for, to think about today. If you, as a therapist, are the one completing GG, and it's not an interdisciplinary process, then that is going to potentially hurt you next year when we move on to the outcome scores because it's got to reflect the usual performance over three days at the beginning and the usual over three days at the end. So just keep that in mind. Another measure that was finalized in this year's rule was um, the potentially preventable 30-day post-discharge readmission measure. So this one has been finalized for collection beginning October 1 of 19, and this one will be collected off the claims. Originally what they did was they had said we, we're going to use just one year claims data, but they changed that this year and said no, we're going to use two years of claims data because what they found was that um, by only using one year, it was going to exclude a lot of smaller skilled nursing facilities. So by expanding it to two years, they were able to include almost all skilled nursing facilities. The other thing that they, that they finalized is that they, instead of reporting this um, measure on a um, calendar year, they changed it and want to begin reporting it on a fiscal year again. Medicare also informed us in this rule that they are working on several other measures such as pain, flu vaccine, antipsychotic use, and refining the discharge to community measure. There were a lot of providers who wrote in and said that Medicare should not include those residents who are residents in the long-term care prior to the Part A stay because that would unfairly skew the numbers for some facilities. So Medicare does plan to do more research on this area. For the fourth area and the final one that we're going to cover um, for this rule, Medicare finalized some requirements to the SNF value-based purchasing program and especially how they would calculate payments. And I think it's important as therapists who, working, who are working in an interdisciplinary team that we understand and realize the impact that we can have on rehospitalization. Currently, the readmission measure for skilled nursing facilities is the only measure in this value-based purchasing program. So essentially, um, it is any time a patient is readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of being admitted to a skilled nursing facility within 24 hours of discharge from the hospital, then it counts against the skilled nursing facility. So again, the patient must have been admitted to the skilled nursing facility within 24 hours of hospital discharge but then if they go back to the hospital in those next 30 calendar days, the, um, the skilled nursing facility gets one counted against it. So um, Medicare plans to replace this with the potentially preventable conditions as soon as they can, but they have not decided when to do that. So right now, they are going to be looking at calendar year 2017, and they're going to look at how much a skilled nursing facility achieved compared to their peers in calendar year 2017. And that you're going to get a score based on how you rate against all your peers. Then they're going to look at how much you have improved between calendar year 15 and calendar year 17 and give you points allocated for that. So you can see that um, a, uh, a facility has two ways that they can possibly get, um, get count, points counted. And this is very important because it will impact a skilled nursing facility's payment beginning next year. So again, as I said, everything matters. And we have a big role as therapists in preventing and managing rehospitalizations. So um, they collect all of this through the claims, and they've been collecting it for calendar year 15, 16, and 17. So they announced what the performance standards were in this rule for fiscal year 2019, which essentially means that beginning October 1, 18, your payment could be up or down depending on whether you met 
the threshold and or the benchmark level. So what Medicare is going to be doing is at the end of this calendar year, December 31st, 2017, taking a facility's rehospitalization rate and comparing it to calendar year 15 and looking at what, what your level of achievement was. If you, if you have achieved a 20.4% rehospitalization rate or lower, you are in a good place. If you achieve a rehospitalization rate of 16.399%, you're in even a better place. If your rehospitalization rate is higher than that, then you may be receiving a reduction in all of your payments beginning October 1 of next year. So that's why it's so critical, because this is what's called the value-based purchasing program. Beginning next October, um, Medicare has said, that they will take 2% out of everybody's claims. So every time a skilled nursing facility submits for, for payment, they're going to automatically get 2% removed from it. But depending on your scores, if you are in that achievement threshold area or in the benchmark area, then you, you will receive some or all of that 2% back. So. That is, um, that is how the system works, and that's why, you know, October 1 to December 31st, 2017 is kind of your last chance to really impact that rehospitalization rate for next year. Um, what the 60% re represents is that Medicare has said this is not going to be a budget neutral program, which means that for all the money they collect to give out, they're only going to give out 60% of that money as rewards, and the other 40% they're keeping to pay back some of the Medicare program. So that's why the, the, um, the, the um, performance becomes so important. They did announce what 2020 performance standards will be. So again, what they're going to do is take fiscal year 18, which starts October 1 of 17, so fourth quarter 17 becomes very important between October 1 of 17 and um, September 30th of 18 will impact your payment beginning in 19. And you can see that they have raised the bar a little bit for fiscal year 2020 with a little bit better achievement threshold and a little bit better benchmark. So do what you can, work with your facilities to impact rehospitalization rate. All of these are going to be published on Nursing Home Compare. Um, they're going to be updating Nursing Home Compare, and they're going to show every nursing home in the country what their rate is. So all in all, the, um, the final rule for fiscal year 2018 skilled nursing facilities, um, the Medicare projects that they will put $370 million back into the program through both the 1% update as well as potentially the value-based purchasing program. And the cost for skilled nursing facilities to submit all of this data under the QRP, they project to be a minus $29 million. So in essence, they are saying that the skilled nursing facility industry is coming out ahead in this year's final rule. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Amy. Thanks so much for providing that overview, Ellen. Given the changes that Ellen just outlined, I think you'll agree that it is essential for providers of care in skilled nursing facilities to measure and assess how well your facility is performing on quality performance measures such as tissue integrity, functional outcomes and self-care mobility, and rehospitalization. October 1st of this year will begin a one-year runway until data collection begins on October 1 of 2018. The goal for this year should be to optimize your performance in these areas to minimize the risk of financial penalties in 2019. As you perform your internal quality audit, it is important to look at the drivers of quality measure outcomes for your patients and distinguish what sets good outcomes apart from poorer outcomes. This may be assessed through many different lenses of the care plan, but some factors to consider may include the quality of your interdepartmental collaboration, the presence of clinical programming that can screen for, catch, and proactively treat impairments before they lead to poor clinical outcomes, 
and rehabilitation provided by well-trained and consistent therapy professionals. Other metrics to consider may include the duration of therapy services provided and the length of stay, and the impact that these factors have on overall outcomes and recidivism. At ACP, we are particularly interested in exploring the effect of biophysical agents on a variety of clinical outcomes, as this can lead to enhancement or refinement of clinical programs and pathways as we seek to affect performance improvement in a variety of quality measures. To help objectively quantify the impact of comprehensive clinical programming augmented by physical agent modalities, ACP has invested in a few studies using public or donated data analyzed by an independent agency, the Moran Company. The results of these studies are briefly summarized on the next slide. In an analysis of 2015 five-star quality measure data in which ACP established skilled nursing facility customers were compared to non-ACP SNF customers, ACP established customers demonstrated superior performance with skin integrity achieving 36.4% better scores on this short-stay pressure ulcer measure. In a separate study that assessed patient functional performance using the care tool item set, patients treated with ACB biophysical agents, e-stim, diathermy, and ultrasound, achieved significantly greater functional measure outcomes compared with those patients not treated with biophysical agents. The results included a 23% greater improvement in mobility and an 11% greater improvement in self-care performance. Moreover, the use of PAMS was effective to produce significant outcome improvement across all levels of independence, from the most dependent to the least dependent individuals. We'll explore this study and these results in more details in the next few slides. To conduct this study, the Moran Company collected PHI-redacted medical record data donated from a long-term ACB customer partner who was an early adopter of the care tool assessment and mandated its collection for all items for all Med-A beneficiaries. The data set that was analyzed included admission and discharge functional assessments collected over a 17-month period running from April 2014 through September 2015 and included over 25,000 Medicare A stays across 81 skilled nursing facilities. The Moran Company used this data to assess the difference in functional outcomes between those patients that received treatment augmented by ACP program modalities and those that did not. This table summarizes the results of that comparison and shows the total self-care and total mobility score performance for Med-A patients. In the self-care domain, the use of one or more of the study modalities yielded an improvement outcome of 38%. In contrast, treatment delivered without the use of modalities yielded an improvement of 27%, demonstrating an 11 percentage point difference between treatment with PAMS versus treatment without. In the mobility domain, the use of one or more of the study modalities yielded an improvement outcome of 66%, compared to a 43% improvement for treatment delivered without a modality, a 23 percentage point difference between treatment with PAMS versus treatment without. You'll also note on this slide that individuals treated with modalities began at an overall lower level of function and self-care mobility when compared to those that did not receive modality intervention. Yet you will also note that the end scores for those individuals treated with modalities exceeded those that did not. In light of the lower starting status of independence for patients who receive modalities, it is worth exploring whether the greater rate of change was influenced by the fact that these patients had more room to improve. To examine this, the Moran Company grouped patients into four level of assistance categories based on how dependent the patients were on the care item set functional measures upon admission. What you see in this slide is that the average improvement in overall self-care mobility functional assessment scores were greater for those treated with modalities than for those that were not across all levels of assistance. The greater rate of improvement achieved when modalities are incorporated as an adjunct to a strong clinical rehabilitation program are certainly important from a patient quality of life perspective but these results are also operationally impactful if we view them in relation to the new quality reporting program functional quality measures adopted for the SNF final rule that Ellen detailed earlier. Over the next several visits to your facility, 
your ACP Clinical Program Consultant will engage with you on how to optimize your programming to achieve similar results and to ensure that you are on a path to success with QRP when data collection begins next year. If you have questions on this topic, we encourage you to reach out to me, Amy Hobbs, Director of Clinical Services for Accelerated Care Plus at ahobbs at hangar.com, or please reach out to Ellen, owner of Rehab Resources and Consulting Incorporated, at her website address listed here on the slide. On behalf of Ellen and ACP, I thank you very much for joining us today. This concludes our webinar.